Steve D'Angelo has been called one of the most powerful men in the cannabis industry by Fortune magazine. A California state politician named him the father of the cannabis industry. But no matter what you call him, you respect his impact on the legalization of cannabis in California and around the world. Steve D'Angelo is on In the Weeds with Jimmy Young next. Steve D'Angelo, I'm Jimmy Young. Welcome to Boston. Thanks for having me, Jimmy. Hello, Boston. Hi, Jimmy. How are you? Kurt from Cannabis.net. You, you actually... Steve, sorry. You, that's right. You actually, uh, Steve, you actually were interviewed by Kurt Dalton a few years back. Uh, his site is Cannabis.net, and this is the first time that you and I are talking, and indeed it is uh, a thrill, to be honest with you, because uh, those who are in this business have a ton of respect for you and the hard work that you've done. I do want you to start right off and talk a little bit about your last prisoner project and why it's so important and why you've taken this up as a cause right now. Sure. Well, it's, it's important because there are still tens of thousands of people who are in prison. Um, you know, we've, we've reformed uh, laws in the majority of the states in the United States. We have a industry, a legal industry that's creating intergenerational wealth for, for some people. <clears throat> but meanwhile, uh, 40,000 plus people in the United States remain incarcerated for cannabis offenses for something that never should have been a crime in the first place. So um, I'm calling on the cannabis industry and the cannabis community to put together a legal defense organization to uh, go to um, uh, all of the states uh, uh, and eventually all the countries around the world where people are still locked up and get them out. That's a tremendous goal, uh, Steve, but I, if there's one person on this earth who can probably pull this off, it's you, uh, just because of all the work that you've done. Uh, one of the neat stories that I found out about you as I was doing some background checks, you were born in Philadelphia, am I right? Correct. And in the early 70s, and you and I, by the way, are just about a year apart in age. I'm, I'm one year older than you. Okay? Uh, I was born in 57. Uh, in the 70s, you were actually instrumental in trying to get uh, cannabis legalized in Washington, D.C. Am I right? Were you not fighting for that cause then? Yeah, I mean, I, I began my cannabis career as a cannabis activist in 1974. I put on my uh, first smoke in in, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> and throughout the 1970s, we were able to make a significant amount of progress uh, until Ronald Reagan was elected and, and he, he pushed all of that progress backwards. And, Kurt, you got a question? I know you do. So, uh, Steve, uh, we're on the East Coast. I was wondering if you talk a little bit about Oh, tell the listeners and the viewers uh, about Harborside and then also going public. What was it like to, for the process of taking a cannabis company that touches the flower as well as your name recognition and getting it public? Could you give us kind of the, the, uh, the version of what it was like for you? Yeah, well, you know, the trajectory of Harborside is, is very, very interesting. <clears throat> we were one of the first six cannabis businesses that was licensed in the United States. That happened in 2006 when the city of Oakland became the first jurisdiction anywhere to issue can commercial cannabis licenses. And our mission in the beginning was to create a gold standard for cannabis retailing, to prove that uh, when done with intention and intelligence, that cannabis uh, retailing could bring benefits to communities uh, rather than harms. And, um, and so uh, over the course of uh, 12 to 15 years, we succeeded in doing that. Um, we wanted to make sure that Oakland uh, was not the last jurisdiction to, to license dispensaries. And, and so um, we, we were pretty successful in that task. Uh, it wasn't easy. The federal government uh, tried very, very hard to close us down along the way. We uh, engaged in multiple bouts of litigation with them. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> just in 2016, uh, they gave up a civil forfeiture uh, case that they were prosecuting against us, and um, and uh, and that enabled us to start moving towards the the public offering. So, less than three years after the the the, the most powerful government on the planet uh, stopped trying to close us down, we were able to go public on the Canadian uh, Securities Exchange. So, um, that, that, that it was a tremendous uh, tra trajectory and a great accomplishment.
Absolutely. And, uh, you know, now that you are publicly traded, Steve, and, and enlighten me a little bit more about a, a public company, you are uh, you have to report to your stockholders all of your uh, doings and all this. Exactly how is your company structured? And I believe when you went public, you did a reverse offering or something like that? Yeah, well, you know, unfortunately, uh, in the United States, we are not able to exchange to access our own public exchanges like the NASDAQ right. or the the New York Stock Exchange. And so uh, we were we, we the only place we could get publicly listed uh, was the Canadian uh, Securities Exchange and the Canadian Securities Exchange only lists Canadian companies. So what we did was uh, merged with a much smaller Canadian company who was already listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange, uh, and that enabled us uh, to to then list there and meet all of their requirements. But it's it, it is a crazy situation because uh, right now Canadian companies who do exactly the same thing that our company does, uh, who have uh, footprints um, uh, in Canada, uh, growing and selling cannabis are allowed to, to list on the stock exchange and uh, the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Uh, but American companies, or companies who have activities in America, uh, like ours, uh, are still unable to list on the U.S. public exchanges. There's a lot of movement in Washington, D.C. right now about, uh, and a lot of talk about safe banking. You were one of the founders of the NCIA, the National Cannabis Industry Association. They've done, in fact, that's where you and I actually met in passing at Lobby Days in May down in D.C. And I wonder, um, talk a little bit about where, what you know is going on in D.C. You know, that Safe Banking Act has moved away from the House now and is in committees in the Senate. And are we ever going to see public banking or having access to the banking industry for the cannabis uh, group? Well, you know, I, I strongly support all of the efforts that are being made with the Safe Banking Act. But I'm, I'm far from convinced that the passage of a Safe Banking Act would really solve the problem. And the reason for that is, is that bankers are extremely conservative creatures. As long as cannabis is a Schedule One substance under the Controlled Substances Act, I think it's going to be very, very difficult to persuade the majority of bankers to do business with cannabis businesses. Um, uh, this is a problem that could be solved with one phone call uh, uh, from President Trump to the DEA administrator, uh, instructing the administrator to reschedule or better yet, deschedule cannabis. I think that that as long as we have a Schedule One designation for cannabis, uh, financial services are going to be remain remain challenging for us to access. Uh, I remember reading a little bit about it. It actually could be that decision to remove it from the Controlled Substances Act at a Schedule One. I've actually heard it could actually just be an administrative decision. That's what you're telling us, right? Yes. Um, you know, uh, there's this popular misconception that the only way to reschedule or deschedule cannabis is by an act of Congress, but that's wrong. The Controlled Substances Act explicitly authorizes the administrator of the Drug Enforcement Administration to reclassify uh, any substance um, when new scientific information comes in. And, of course, there's been an abundance of new scientific information uh, that has come in. Um, so the, the DEA administrator is an employee of the president. He works for the executive branch. It would take one phone call from the president to the administrator. Um, uh, for cannabis to be completely removed from the Controlled Substances Act. And in fact, that is what should happen. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a piece of, another piece of little known history. In 1970, when the Controlled Substances Act was being debated by Congress, the decision was made to put cannabis into the Schedule One designation temporarily, because even in 1970, people were pushing back on the crazy idea that cannabis should be a Schedule One. So what happened is, is Congress um, uh, temporarily put cannabis into Schedule One, pending the impaneling and a report by a presidential Blue Ribbon Commission. That Blue Ribbon Commission was headed by a guy named, Doc, uh, named Raymond Shaker, who is the former governor of Pennsylvania, a Republican, a former prosecutor, a center-right guy. 
But he put together a genuine, real, science-based report on cannabis. And that report came back uh, with what every other science-based report comes back with cannabis, um, that it is, doesn't cause criminality or, or, or insanity um, uh, or anything else bad. Um, and the Schaefer Commission recommended uh, that, uh, that cannabis uh, be removed from Schedule 1. They said it doesn't belong in Schedule 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. The Schaefer Commission said that cannabis should be removed from the controlled substances schedule entirely, and the nonprofit transfer of cannabis between adults should be decriminalized. So uh, cannabis was never intended to stay in Schedule 1 permanently, but unfortunately, you know, President Nixon never allowed that report to go back to Congress, and, and the issue was never reopened. So it's, it's long past overdue uh, for that to happen. You know, you and I are both, um, we grew up in the 60s and the early 70s, and uh, it was quite a uh, tumultuous time in our nation's history. Um, I, you know, our earliest, my, one of my earliest memories, of course, is when Kennedy got assassinated, and then the next memory was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, but that's another story. Um, and, of course, we also lived through Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King. And, you know... We had a lot of division in our country in the 60s and 70s, and a lot of people like yourself, and I walked in protest of the Vietnam War as well. And now here we are 30, 40 years later, and I'm not quite sure we've actually made as much progress in race relations and even in relations between people that are different than we have now. And in the 60s and 70s, weren't we all about make love, not war? <laughs> Whatever happened to that? Well, I think um, that there is a, a, a whole new generation of young people that is embracing those uh, same ideals. Uh, you know, when I look around and I think see things like Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matters, um, uh, I see the the echoes of the values that 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 we had. When I see things like you know the ongoing struggle for gay liberation, for trans rights, um, I see our values in in, in action. So. I actually think the world has changed uh, uh, quite a lot. Um, we are, we're not anywhere near where we need to be. But, you know, I these days I'm lucky enough to spend my time uh, traveling around the world. And everywhere I go, I meet up with young people who grew up with keyboards in their hands and, and in one hand and, and a joint in the other hand. <laughs> I call them the smartest generation, right? <laughs> um, I love that. And, and Right. And, 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 and the thing is, no matter what country they come from, they're imbued with a common set of values, right? They are tolerant of people that are different from them. They, 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 they work towards racial justice. They respect the environment. They're trying to eat and conduct their lives in a way that's more in balance with nature. They try to be kinder and gentle with one another and with the other creatures we share this planet with. I see that. There is a worldwide global tribe of people who have been awoke by this plant. So uh, much as I look around and I despair um, at, at, at where politics is at, at the continuing militarism, at, at the way that, that nature continues to be abused, um, I'm also just really inspired and full of hope uh, by this new generation that's coming up who's, who's so completely embracing and living out these ideals. Steve, I had a question for you. During uh, an interview I did with you a year or two ago, I, I asked you if you could had to go to a deserted island for the rest of your life. You, you could only take two strains with you, and you nailed it right in the interview. You said which strains you would take for the rest of your life. Do you remember your answer? Yeah, it would probably be a Granddaddy Purple and a Neville's Hay. That's yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> you got it right. So this time I decided with a new question. We had Oh yeah, go ahead. We had an this article come out on cannabis.net about a week ago is who's on your Mount Rushmore of weed. And you had been nominated by some of our, our readers as you gotta put Steve D'Angelo on there. So I'm gonna put you on the spot in the same way and say who is on your Mount Rushmore of cannabis as if you could put three or four people up there. Well, Jack Herrer and Dennis Perrone uh, would definitely need to be up there, and uh, we don't want to just have men on Mount Rushmore, for Christ's sake, so um, <laughs> uh, we would need to put Brownie Mary up there, too, um, uh, along with us. Um, uh, I'd say that, you know, that, that, would be a, that that would be a good start. Not Bob Marley, not Tommy Chong, not the people that perhaps uh, those that aren't fam as 
tied into the industry as you are in California? I mean, those are the names that come up when we talk about Mount Rushmore. Well, here's the thing. When um, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the worldwide renaissance of cannabis that we are seeing today uh, was not a given. It did not come easily. It was the result of decades of really, really difficult struggle, persistent struggle in the face of overwhelming odds by people like Dennis Perone and Jack Herrick. Dennis Perone got, got arrested 14 or 15 times in the course of getting cannabis into the hands of AIDS patients. In one of those raids, he was shot by police. As soon as he got out of the hospital, he started doing exactly the same thing. Jack Herrick crisscrossed this country from one side to the other. He went all around the globe telling people the truth about cannabis. And he kept on doing that until he was taken down by a stroke on stage in the middle of a speech. So if I'm going to put heroes up on our Mount Cannabis, I'm going to put the heroes up there who were really the people who fought and struggled, who were in the trenches. Um, uh, God bless Bob Marley. Um, uh, I, I, I love his music. He's inspired millions of people. Um, I certainly believe that he belongs in the, you know, in the Hall of, of Music, uh, Hall of Fame of Music, and he deserves to be honored as, as, as you know, an incredible artist and, and, and a prophetic artist. But if we're talking about the cannabis struggle and the people who are most responsible for the cannabis renaissance that we're seeing today, yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's people like Jack and, 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 and Brownie Mary. You know, Brownie Mary's story is incredible. Brownie Mary was 70 years old, 70, 71 years old. And uh, this is the middle of the AIDS crisis in, in San Francisco. There's funerals happening all over the place. And she's a volunteer at San Francisco General on the AIDS ward. So Dennis Perone collects weed from, from underground cannabis growers, gives it to, to Mary. Mary cooks it into brownies, and she takes it into SF General. And she gets busted for doing that, not once, not twice. She gets busted three times in a row. And there's this amazing video clip of her. It's, it's, she had just gotten released from jail, and she gets up on stage, and she says something like, God damn it, I would do it all over again. You know? Um, so I feel like those people deserve to be honored. All right, that's well, great. We, we, your Mount Rushmore is better. That, 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 much on. better. That's right. That's right. So much for that Mount Rushmore idea, Kurt. For Forget about. Tommy Chong. Sorry. That's right. That's right. I, I get it. Um, you know, in Massachusetts, we're kind of new to the adult use recreational world. We haven't even had this out there for about a year. Um, they are selling over $1 million of adult use recreational weed in Massachusetts every day now through the 22 dispensaries. They had a hearing today in Massachusetts uh, by by the Cannabis Control Commission, they're trying to put body cams on delivery services in Massachusetts for cannabis. Uh, what's your reaction to that? Uh, it sounds like a, uh, a, a, a solution in search of a problem, um, uh, at least in California and, and certainly in, in our shops where we've conducted tens of thousands of deliveries over the course of almost 15 years. Um, we haven't had, uh, I think, a single report of an adverse uh, uh, customer interaction with a with a delivery person. So uh, it doesn't sound like like there's there's a problem there that needs to be addressed. On the other hand, um, every single regulation, every single requirement, every single piece of of, of new equipment. Uh, has a cost associated with it, an expense associated with it. And one of the real challenges that we're seeing across the country, I'm sure it's a factor in Massachusetts too, is that the cost of doing business in the legal cannabis market um, is higher, considerably higher than the cost of doing business in the unregulated market. And those costs ultimately need to be passed on to the consumers. And so if you're not careful about regulatory requirements and, and, and really, you know, requiring more than is necessary, you end up in a situation where the price of cannabis in the legal market is much, much higher than the price of cannabis in the unregulated market. And that's when you start seeing outflow, uh, people leaving the legal market and going to the unregulated market. So there's a real danger in, in overregulation, and, and this to me sounds like an example of it. And not to mention, I think, an invasion of personal liberties and civil liberties. And, you know, there's enough... 
we're always on camera for crying out loud. And of course, we're on camera right now. But again, even if you walk down the street, you're on a camera somewhere in security. You know, there's a security camera somewhere focusing on it. And I just feel like we're always under the microscope. And adding another camera into this transaction just makes absolute no sense to me. I agree with you 100% about the cost of doing business inside the market and how it is actually feeding the illegal market. I, I got to ask you a little bit, uh, some insight about Humboldt county in in california what's going on there right now it, it, tell us a, a little bit about that steve because uh, i understand there's been some raids there they're they're trying to get some people in humboldt county on the regulated side tell us a little bit about what's going on in humboldt county well you know what's going on in california in general and, and it's and it's happening in humboldt county in a in a, in a noticeable way is is that the regulatory requirements of the state of California have been so demanding, right? I mean, cannabis in California is basically regulated more strictly than radioactive waste is. Um, uh, and those requirements have, have made it close to impossible for a majority of the legacy cannabis growers, people who are growing cannabis for years and years in California, to come into the legal marketplace. Um, uh, and it takes a minimum of hundreds of thousands of dollars for somebody to get a license. And we're talking about small growers who went up into the hills, not because they wanted to get rich, but because they wanted to live a lifestyle that was closer to nature and raise their children in a community um, uh, that was more in alignment with their with their own values. And, and those folks um, are having a very difficult time now because uh, there are large corporations who can uh, hire um, armies of attorneys and very sophisticated compliance departments and raise money on public exchanges in order to, to, to get licensed. But the smaller legacy growers don't have those assets. So um, what's happening is 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 because of because of that largely um, uh, the the this the sales in the regulated marketplace are not as high as was anticipated. The state is not seeing the kind of tax revenue uh, that they wanted, um, and uh, and so what they're trying to do is um, is drive uh, is 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 use the same tactics that have been used during prohibition to try and drive people out of the cannabis market. And I think it's the wrong way to do it. Um, you know, instead of having raids, what they should do is they should lower the licensing requirements to something that is reasonable. Welcome these folks into the legal system. Um, you know, legalization was supposed to bring an end to raids. It was, it was, it was supposed to bring an end to people going to prison for cannabis. Um, not more of it. Uh, and, um, and, and so there's a simple answer. The answer is that you use market forces and sensible regulation. Uh, right now in California, there's a tax rate uh, that in many places equals 40%, right? Wow. Um, that's also driving consumers to the underground market. So lower those taxes. Um, uh, make the licensing requirements reasonable. Uh, maybe have a fund to give loans to small farmers so that they're able to meet the licensing requirements. Um, that's a much better strategy than trying to send in helicopters and paramilitaries and all the stuff that's been tried for 50 or 60 years and already failed. Yeah, uh, Steve, you, you, you touched on an interesting point. Where is it of today for Harborside? If I wanted to buy a pound of Granddaddy Purple, your finest, <laughs> what does it cost me at Harborside? And I'm sure you know this answer is, the next answer is, what can I get that same pound for on the gray or black market today in California? Hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the general rule of thumb is you're, you're, you, are, you are paying um, uh, somewhere close to twice as much in the, in the legal market as you are in the unregulated market once everything is added in. Um, uh, sometimes it may be a little bit more or a little bit less, depending on what kind of deals that, that you can find. But there is a large price disparity um and um and 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 you know it's 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 really a problem because what we found is the people who are being driven to the unregulated market 
are people who most need the protections of the legal market, right? Uh, uh, folks who are in disability, uh, senior citizens, other people who are on limited incomes, uh, families who have severely ill children so that the parents can't work. Uh, those are the folks that are being pushed back to the illicit market where the cannabis that they're getting is untested. Nobody really knows what's in it, where the selection that they have is, is, is much more narrow. It's much more difficult for them to understand what their dosage is or, or, or what cannabinoids uh, they are getting. So it's, um, it's, it's really a problem. Uh, I think that it, it will work itself out over time, but, um, but it's, a, it's an unfortunate situation right now. And I'm hoping that somehow, some way, uh, it will get better, Steve. If you had to look into your crystal ball, finally, uh, where are we going to be in two years, five years, ten years? Any idea? It depends on where you're talking about. You know, I, I think that in the state of California, over the course of the next two or three years, that you're going to see uh, more movement into the legal part of the market. I think you're going to see the illicit market uh, shrinking. Um, uh, I think that overall in in the United States, that within a two two to three year period, I think we're going to see significant reform at the federal level. Uh, quite possibly a a, a descheduling of cannabis uh, entirely. Um, uh, on the global level. Um, we are already seeing the movement that we started in California in the early 1990s sweeping the entire globe now. Um, uh, 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 major European countries like Germany not only have medical cannabis, but they're distributing medical cannabis through their national health service. Uh, so the government is paying for people's cannabis. <clears throat> Why? Because it's, it's such an effective medicine. The same thing now is beginning to happen um, uh, in, uh, in Asia, which uh, traditionally has been one of the most resistant places to cannabis reform. So Thailand and South Korea both now are in the process of enacting medical cannabis legislation, a huge breakthrough. And I just came uh, back from spending almost a month in Colombia, um, and, uh, and uh, Colombia uh, now has a legal cannabis industry, um, and the rest of Latin America is is already racing to catch up with them. So um, this is going to continue all around the world. Cannabis is um, is just too valuable for for people for nations to ignore. Ultimately, I don't know whether it takes ten years, twenty years, but we will see the day that cannabis by dollar value is the most valuable product on the planet. Fantastic. Steve D'Angelo, the father of the cannabis industry. I'll tell you, one of the things I love about talking to people in the industry is learning the history of it and talking to people like yourself that have this kind of knowledge and history of it. And I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to join us for the last uh, few minutes, 30 minutes or so. And I look forward to uh, one day sitting down with you and, you know, perhaps uh, sharing a little something, something out there. You know what I'm saying, Steve? Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see. We'll see if some of that granddaddy or Neville Space is around, huh? Well, wait a minute, Steve. I know you're going to be down at Canex in Jamaica. I'll be there. Why don't we invite Jimmy down? Can, Jimmy can make it to Jamaica, I bet. I love Jamaica. Are you kidding me? I've been, I've been there many times. Been there many times. Steve uh, D'Angelo, you can find out more about him online. Just Google him. He's all over the internet. He's got his own show on Greenflower. And of course, remember, his, his latest project is The Last Prisoner Project. And you can find out about that at lastprisonerproject.org. Steve D'Angelo, thank you so much for joining us on We Talk Live with Kurt and Jimmy. In the Weeds with Jimmy Young is a production of the Pro Cannabis Media Group for the education and information of our listening audience. The opinions on this podcast are strictly those of the hosts of the program and do not represent Pro Cannabis Media or any of its affiliates. No medical advice is given and any use of cannabis should be by adults over the age of 21 and used responsibly.